Overwatch 2 released recently, and well, it's actually been doing extremely, extremely well. The viewership over on Twitch is super, super high, although that may be in due part to drops and sponsorships, but now that that's over, it's actually retaining its numbers and performing better than Apex and Valorant on most days. Uh, so there are a ton of people playing the game, and a ton of people are also talking about it all over the internet. But everywhere you look, everywhere on, on the internet, if you're looking at Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitch chats, there's always this question of what's the difference between Overwatch 2 and the original? The answer is that there's actually a lot different, but the real issue here is that that is a question that exists in the first place. It shouldn't be around. So in this video, we're going to dive into what's been going on with Overwatch and why the game has been picking up the nickname of Overwatch 1.1 or 1.6 or 1.5, whatever you want to call it. I like the idea of 1.6. The big driving point behind the 1.1 joke is the game doesn't feel like a full sequel. But what even makes a good sequel? To figure this out, we are going to look into what a sequel actually is, and we're going to look around at the rest of the gaming industry to figure out what it looks like for a video game specifically. A sequel by definition is just a piece of work that expands upon some earlier work. In the same way movies and books expand upon their past titles, sequel games are supposed to expand on, to, on their predecessors. Sequels have been around in gaming for a long time now, dating back to when Space Invaders 2 was released to arcades. Over the years, there have been a lot, and I mean a lot, of sequels. They're everywhere nowadays. Call of Duty has like 40 games in the franchise. Every game that has ever made money has gotten a 2 put next to it. And I googled list of Final Fantasy games and was taken aback by this absolute pseudo spreadsheet of a Wikipedia page the series has. Like, what am I even looking at here? Anyways, in story based games like God of War or Last of Us, the sequels are new games that develop and present new pieces of the story to the player. Games like this will, ha will usually have a couple gameplay innovations and changes to the structure of the game. But there isn't much of a requirement for it since the game is about the story it is actually telling. More than anything else. And, and Overwatch is just not one of those games that fits that genre. So, we won't be focused on that type of game. No, Overwatch actually fits into a different genre of games. We're talking about PvP games that are exclusively gameplay driven. Most major titles like this do include some sort of campaign or at least some pve option but we'll dive into that a bit more later with games like this namely the cods the battlefields and the halos of the world they have to focus on innovating their gameplay and the features surrounding it if they want their sequels to succeed that's what gives these games that sequel feeling game after game after game after game but i want to go a bit more in depth on this i want to show y'all what's a good and what's a bad sequel in this genre of a video of course, we're going to go from bad to good. So we're going to cover the most recent bad sequel that I have in my own recent memory. I considered doing Battlefield 2042 for this, but that game suffers from changing actually too much, which isn't the issue that Overwatch has exactly. Also, I don't think I can bear to think and like write about Battlefield 2042 after I got so, so excited for that game over the beta, and then it just turned into the dumpster fire that it is now so instead we will be talking about what happened with halo infinite actually and why it isn't what i would consider to be a good sequel title halo infinite it had its issues and there's no denying that but we're interested in specifically what made the game a bad sequel and not what made the game fail in general first thing we're going to look at is the gameplay and associated features of the game Overall, the gameplay of Halo Infinite was, at its core, just exactly the same as any other Halo game. I will give them credit. They added a new slide mechanic, which felt great. They added a bunch of equipment, which was a ton of fun. Like, hell, I even have tutorials about a lot of that equipment. But the new stuff that they did add felt great, and I loved it. But the overall gameplay of the game was still just Halo. The solid gameplay base was there with fresh mechanics, but the surrounding features to go with it just wasn't there. It, and because of that, it didn't end up being a good sequel. At launch, there were no game modes that felt fun or new. It made you feel like there it was, you were playing a revamped Halo experience. There's no Forge mode. There's no, like, I know a lot of people wanted Battle Royale, but there wasn't any of that either. Like, there just wasn't anything fresh and new. At the end of the day, you were just picking up, you're running down the map, 
sitting up guns shooting people, just like every other Halo. Don't get me wrong, it's one of my favorite gameplay loops ever. But it just doesn't make for a great sequel, you know what I'm saying? Halo Infinite added all this new stuff, but as core, it still just felt like every single Halo game that came before it. Now, I told you we would talk about how these big name games usually have a campaign or some PvE mode to go along with it. Halo has quite literally always had a campaign of some kind associated with it. And while it wasn't a true staggered release for Halo Infinite, it sure as hell felt like it was a staggered release because we just had our hands on the multiplayer PvP experience of Halo Infinite long before we had our hands on the ex on the campaign of the game. This stagger definitely had an adverse effect on the game. We played the multiplayer and got our fill of it very quickly because, again, the gameplay felt largely the same and just largely outdated, and it didn't innovate on anything, and that destroyed a lot of the hype for the campaign. This also wasn't helped by the fact that they, that they didn't have the co-op mode for the campaign either. But I want you to keep in mind this staggered release for later on in the loop. Not to mention how Forge mode isn't even out yet. With Halo Infinite overall, it just felt like we got a super basic version of Halo. There weren't many things that they added to make the game feel like a fresh and new and fun experience for the player. If, in fact, it felt like there were more things cut from the game than were added to the game. At the end of the day, and I can't stress this enough, it just felt like you were say playing a same Halo game that you've played for the past 20 years of your life. So, that was an example of a bad sequel. So what about a good one? Well, of course, since I can't help myself, I have to talk about Titanfall 2. I was sitting down and uh, thinking about what would be a good example of a sequel game in this genre of video game, and of course, my mind wandered to my favorite game of all time, and I realized how well Titanfall 2 actually fits into this mold of a good sequel game. So, let me explain. Titanfall 1 was a pretty basic sci-fi FPS game with wall running, shooting people, and of course giant sexy robots. The gameplay was fun, but we're not here to talk about the first game, we're here to talk about the sequel and what made it a good sequel. Titanfall 2 did quite literally everything a good sequel needs to do. Again, let's talk about gameplay first because I think gameplay is the most important part of any video game. Titanfall 2 innovated and changed nearly every aspect of its of the first game's gameplay and the features surrounding it from Titanfall 1. Titanfall 1 movement was very floaty and bouncy. The main tech was essentially just be hopping around the map and wall running as much as you can to make it as hard as possible for you to get shot. It was a little clunky, but Titanfall took this and improved upon it in every single way possible. Instead of just sprinting and trying to b-hop your way around, Titanfall 2 added a sliding mechanic. I've heard around the community that um, the slide was supposed to stop us from b-hopping, but it kind of had the opposite effect. And from my perspective, this is the best sliding mechanic in gaming. For, like past, present, probably future for a couple more years, this has the, been the best m movement mechanic in gaming, all because it added in slide hopping, which is the true best movement mechanic in gaming. Probably... My favorite, besides from like a grappling hook, which Titanfall 2 also have heavily innovated. Are you getting the sense that I just love this game yet? But back to the movement of this game, they add the slide leading to slide hopping, made the wall running faster and easier to chain together, and just overall made the movement feel extremely freeing and just fluid. The gunplay was mostly unchanged, though of course they did add a bunch of guns and repurpose a bunch from the predecessor. The abilities of this game is where a bunch of the changes happened. Titanfall 1 had stem, cloaks, and a radar pulse. Stem in Titanfall 1 was more of a health boost than anything, and the other two function pretty much exactly as you would expect them to. There was this big overhaul to pilot abilities in Titanfall 2, however, Stem was changed to be more of a speed boost, but it did retain its health benefits. Cloak still cloaks you, and Radar Pulse was changed to a Pulse Blade, which is awesome. You get this awesome wall hack kunai to, to which if you throw it at people, and if you, if you hit them, they just get absolutely ragdolled. That's awesome. But if you think that's it, it's not. They also added a bunch of other new pilot abilities. They gave us Phase Shift which is just an interdimensional get out of jail free card. They gave us hollow pilot, which is just calling your enemy a dumbass with extra steps. A wall, which is deployable cover that makes your guns stronger. And finally, the most innovative of which, grapple. 
grapple revolutionized the grapple mechanic in all of gaming for me, being one of the first and definitely the best physics-based grapples in gaming in the gaming industry. Even Halo Infinite has its own version of this. Now, I won't keep ranting on and on about how dope the gameplay is of Titanfall 2. You should just play it instead. Now, we need to stay focused on what makes it a good sequel. So, not only did Titanfall 2 completely revamp and rehaul its gameplay features and the mechanics of the game, it also changed a lot of the supporting features of the game. To name a few, um, the Titan system was completely reworked. Originally, in Titanfall 1, you could kind of make your own Titan to, just based around these three chassis. Now, it's, in Titanfall 2, it's more of a choose-your-hero style. This part was actually kind of controversial, but the point is that it was new and it felt very, very fresh. They also took out the burn card system of Titanfall 1 and revamped it to become the boost system. They also added in a new game mode, so like Bounty Hunt, which was actually supposed to be the main game mode of Titanfall 2. That didn't work out. Or Amped Hardpoint, or I think Titan Brawl as well was new. The point is that everything about the gameplay and the supporting features surrounding it were all added, changed, or revamped to make the game feel fresh and new. <laughs> this alone would have made the game feel like a well-suited sequel to Titanfall 1, but Respawn went a step further. Titanfall 1 didn't really have a campaign. There was a story for the game, and it technically was called a campaign, I think, but all it was was a series of cutscenes that would play between your multiplayer matches. There wasn't that much to it. Titanfall 2 completely changed that. With this game, Respawn made it one of the most acclaimed FPS campaigns in history with a well-thought-out story that pulls on your heartstrings and amazing, amazing level design. I'm not going to go in-depth about it, but you should definitely play Titanfall 2 and find out why that campaign is so critically acclaimed. I hope I drew a good picture for you why Titanfall 2 was a great example of a good sequel title. It changed and renovated everything about itself, making for a whole new, fresh experience for the consumer. So now we know what both a good and a bad example of sequels look like in Overwatch's specific niche of gaming. We're able to fully look into what the heck is going wrong with Overwatch 2. The first and most blatant issue that I can think of with Overwatch 2 is the PvE problem. When Overwatch was announced, it was with intention to have the PvE be released at the same time as the base PvP of the game. Blizzard made it seem like the entire reason they were making Overwatch 2 was this robust and, amb and ambitious PvE experience they had planned out. Now that we're three years down the line, we can see that that kind of fell flat somewhere down the line. Now, I told you to remember the staggered release of Halo Infinite because it feels extremely similar to what's going on here with Overwatch 2. We were all hyped up for this great PvE experience that Blizzard had promised us, but now the PvP has released first and we're all just sitting here like, so where's the PvE? And we're not even as excited for PvE anymore because we have this PvP experience. We're not as excited as we once were about it. But why is the PvE coming back? Well, Blizzard told us themselves that it was mostly just behind the scenes developer issues. So what issues were going on at Blizzard that caused them to delay the main selling point for their game that they've been working on for three years? Well, there were a lot of it would feel like a disservice if I didn't talk about the Blizzard lawsuit in relation to this, and since it almost definitely had an effect on the PvE delay. But I won't be going super in-depth because, honestly, somebody could make a whole hour-long video about this, so I'm just going to give the big picture for this. So there's this ginormous lawsuit against Blizzard, and the entire lawsuit is based around, the, around this premise that the workplace in general was just very bad to women and other marginalized groups and had cultivated a very strong frat boy culture. A lot of the affected people at the company came forward with the stories they organized and began the process of this lawsuit. There were company-wide walkouts and industry-wide repercussions of this. Other game companies looked to Blizzard and using the specific example of Ubisoft stood in solidarity of those affected. But the people filing this lawsuit essentially wanted four things from Blizzard. Into the mandatory arbitration clauses and employee contracts, essentially just better career ladders for the marginalized groups, public data of relative compensation, and a company-wide diversity task force. 
All this meant to make Blizzard a better and more inclusive workplace. Again, I don't want to deep dive into this lawsuit, but I hope the small amount that I did just mention to you gives you an idea of just how tough of a situation the developers at Blizzard and specifically the developers on Overwatch 2 were in. Like, it was a hard situation for them. So, I also want you to note that this lawsuit took place over the entire development period of Overwatch 2, which isn't good as you can imagine but apparently it reached an 18 million dollar um settlement recently which is amazing so surely blizzard learned quickly from the wrongs of their ways have fixed up the company and will never hear about anything like this ever again well never mind then there was another major issue that happened in the middle of overwatch 2's development the lead game director jeff kaplan left Blizzard in April 2021 after 19 years at the company. I don't think I need to tell you that the game director leaving is actually a very, very worrisome thing. We've actually seen this a lot in horror games where there are developmental problems and game directors leaving, and a lot of the time the game just doesn't live up to what it could be. If you want to hear more about horror games and some development issues that happen during a lot of them, I'm going to link this video by Alex Darius in the description down below. Great videos, you should give it a watch. But anyways, Jeff Kaplan leaving Blizzard is more than enough to cause issues behind the scenes. While we can't see a whole lot of what happened externally, you can begin to imagine what happened on the inside and we can participate in just, just a little bit of speculation. If you look outside the gaming industry, another instance where leads of the creative pro process just leave is the film industry. We see this a lot in the film industry, actually. Just to give you a small idea of what happens when there's clashing ideas high up on the ladder, I want to point you towards the semi-recent happenings of the DCEU. The, over there, there's been a ton of issues between Warner Brothers and the directors, and it's all just been a mess, to be honest with you. For instance, with the Justice League, Zack Snyder had to leave halfway through, and Joss Whedon picked up and changed the Lot, including reshoots and the whole shooting match to be honest with you when stuff like this happens the finished product ends up being a shell of what it could have been under one cohesive vision which is super disappointing to a guy like me who usually prefers the dc universe over marvel but that's a whole different hour long video i can make i just wanted to point out the similarities with the directors leaving and why jeff landa leaving development of overwatch 2 caused a lot of red flags and a lot of people's heads However, Jeff Lando was replaced by a very suitable candidate, though. Unlike what happened with the Justice League, where Zack Snyder was replaced by a director with extremely different ideas than him, Jeff's replacement was Aaron Keller, who was a founding member of the Overwatch team. So Aaron has been with the game for a very long time. He knows what makes it special, and even probably a lot of the team trust him and trust the development of Overwatch 2 to him. So, while Jeff leaving was a worrisome event for the development of Overwatch 2, him being replaced by specifically Aaron Keller helped to mitigate at least some of those dark thoughts that consumers were having about the game. So, to recap the last little bit, Overwatch 2 had its fair share of development issues, the two most major of which that we know about externally at least, being the lawsuit happenings and Jeff Landa leaving Blizzard. Even if that's all that happened, it's clearly enough to explain the delays, the mishaps, and all the issues behind the scenes with development. The PvP and the PvE experiences were initially supposed to come out together, but they decided to change that and do a staggered release instead, putting out the PvP experience first, and then in 2023, putting out the PvE portion of the game. The other issue that stopped Overwatch 2 from being and feeling like a true sequel was... Of course, it's gameplay. You remember how when I was talking about Titanfall 2, I kept highlighting all the different changes and additions and how the game felt completely new and fresh and separate from Titanfall 1? Yeah, well, Overwatch isn't really doing that. Overwatch 2's gameplay is just Overwatch. I mean, if you look at these videos, you can hardly tell the difference between the two. Very little about this game just feels new. They changed from a 6v6 to a 5v5 format, which is a good change to me, and is actually a very large rework to the game. But that's the only thing separating Overwatch 2 from Overwatch 1. It's quite literally the only thing that feels different. 
They also reworked some heroes and added some new ones, but they were doing that in Overwatch 1 anyway, so that doesn't even feel different. The core gameplay, when you get down to it, is just the same as Overwatch 1. You choose a type of hero, you wait in the queue, and then you shoot at dudes while pushing an objective. Most of the heroes function exactly the same as they did in Overwatch 1. There's balance changes and reworks, but again, that just feels like Overwatch 1 stuff. The game modes were are nearly exactly the same. They added push and removed 2 CP, but you're still just shooting some dudes and counting your ults while pushing an objective. There was no major evolution of gameplay, nothing that made the basics feel different. In the exact same way Halo Infinite felt like just any Halo game, Overwatch 2 just feels like the same thing as Overwatch 1. The freshness and new game feeling is just not there. So that's why the game is getting called Overwatch 1.6 or 1.1 or 1. whatever number you want. When it comes to large AAA titles in this genre, you need to deliver on making the sequel games feel like sequels. Overwatch 2 just doesn't feel like one. Due to developer issues, Blizzard just straight up didn't fulfill the promise of the PvE, which was kind of the entire reason for the game to be made in the first place, so that just kind of doesn't make sense. To add to that, the gameplay and the features surrounding it are largely the same and don't really make this new game feel like a new game. So, Overwatch 2 just doesn't feel deserving of its 2. This isn't to say that the game isn't great though. I personally have been loving every second of it. I've been playing it every single night with my friends over on Twitch and I really enjoy the game in its current state and I love the 5v5 version of Overwatch. The game is still a lot of fun and is super entertaining even if it doesn't feel like a true sequel to Overwatch 1. But now all we can do is sit and play the game and wait for the PvE release next year. Maybe once that comes out, Overwatch 2 will finally feel deserving of its 2. Anyways guys, thank you very much for watching. This is a new format for me and I actually like it a lot. It was a lot of fun making this video for y'all. Hopefully y'all like it. Remember to subscribe to the channel and comment down below your favorite sequel game or something. I don't know, man. All my different social media is linked down in the description below, like my Twitter or my Twitch. Again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.